I want to talk to you today about coping with disappointment, about carrying it on in life when you have dreams or thoughts about what you would like to do or who you would like to be or how you think things were going to work out that they are not. What do you do next? We're looking together at the fact that we are made to count, that we are designed to have an impact. We were made in the image of God and that drive for significance is a core part of what we are and yet it gets frustrated in all of us. What do we do then? Hey, we hope that you've enjoyed this series flashbacks as we've been revisiting old teaching. This is gonna be our final week in the series flashbacks. We're gonna take two weeks off and be back with brand new content from John on October 21st. So mark your calendars, tell a friend, and we'll see you there. Now back to John. I have been very struck, very moved by the prayer requests that come in. There's just something I don't understand it fully about the little community that God is forming amongst us, mostly online as we connect with each other, that often it's in places of pain and places of brokenness, places where we or the people that we care about find lives not going the way that we thought that they would. And I know for myself, one of the painful parts about that is not just that one bad thing happens, but there are little recurrences of disappointments or problems or setbacks or difficulties that just don't seem to stop. So what do we do? How do we live with that? I was thinking about a character in the Bible that I had never really noticed before. This is in the very beginning of the book of Acts, when the disciples are gathered together. And of course, the crucifixion is the great disappointment, which then becomes the great opportunity for hope. But because Judas, who had been a part of them, has left them, they realize that they're going to have to select somebody to take his place. That number 12 was very significant, the 12 tribes of Israel. So to be whole and complete, they needed 12 apostles. And we're told that they prayed about it and they decided they would select between two different people. And one of them, they say, was Joseph, who was also known as Barsabbas, who was also called Justice. And then the other one was Matthias. Now, the first one is kind of striking because he gets three names. There is um, Joseph. That was quite common. Joseph is Jesus' father, Joseph of Arimathea. So they want to distinguish him a little more carefully. And they say people would call him Barsabbas. But then they give him a third name. And then, to add insult to injury, this is the guy who is not chosen. They pray, and then they actually draw lots. And they choose the other guy. And as far as I know, in the New Testament, that Joseph, also known as Barsabbas, also known as Justice, is never mentioned again. Now imagine being him. I was almost an apostle, missed it by that much. And the way that they decided wasn't to check references or give us an apostle aptitude test. It was to draw lots for crying out loud. I wonder how great his disappointment must have been. And yet it was to be a follower of the crucified Christ. I wonder when he was an old man, if he would tell other people, yep, I was almost one of them. When Da Vinci went to paint the Last Supper, I was almost around that table. He had to bear rejection, not being chosen with grace. In some ways in the early church, he would have been the first person to be deeply disappointed in his dreams. And that's something that occurs to uh, every human being. I was thinking about in the Beatles, there was a drummer, I think his name was Pete Best, and he, he was initially a part of the Beatles, and then it wasn't him, it was Ringo Starr. He went through the rest of his life as the guy who was almost one of the four Beatles. We're learning in this master class from masters of the spiritual life, and we've seen how Ignatius of Loyola found his calling to follow Jesus and have an enormous impact on the world out of deep disappointment, out of both uh, uh, humiliating loss on the battlefield and then physical disfigurement, disappointment in what he thought he was going to be. And out of that came the discovery that God had another call on his life. Somebody else that we'll be learning from in the days to come is a man named Frank Laubach. And among other disappointments, he had desperately wanted to become the president of an educational institution and he lost by one vote. And ironically, he was one of the people that voted and out of politeness, he voted for the other candidate and his own vote was the vote by which he lost. 
And yet he ended up finding God through that and through other deeper losses um, and disappointment in a way that might never have happened if everything had gone really well. Nancy and I were together at a church service uh, quite recently, and it was very striking to me. The pastor talked about um, how God has entered into human hopelessness. We all experience deep disappointment and a deep sense of confusion. And the ultimate expression of this is when Jesus is on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He enters into God forsakenness. When we were in that service, there was a woman in a wheelchair. I think maybe she had suffered uh, some kind of a traumatic brain injury and she was not able to breathe very well and sounds kept coming out of her. And it was the sort of experience where my initial knee jerk reflex, reflex, uh, reflex was to feel a bit distracted and bothered by that. And then it struck me what a wonderful thing it was that she was there and how much God loves her. And that in a sense, that cry of dereliction, abandonment on the cross that Jesus made, she was giving voice to for all of us to hear the pain of a human being. I've thought about so many of you, thought about a conversation with my friend Mo, who is facing real significant challenges. And Mo is saying, you know, the need uh, for people within the church to be able to express lament, which is what Jesus was doing, we are so often chirpy and saccharine. And when that gets, when human pain and disappointment gets treated in superficial ways, it creates even more pain. Think about another friend who is a brilliant academician and facing very serious health issues and has young children and who talks about in the Christian community when people just try to plaster that over with happy talk, it does more damage. Think about Kate Bowler, who has stage four cancer, brilliant academician being kept alive by kind of experimental immunotherapy. And she would actually go to bookstores in the hospital and get books that are written that are kind of chirpy, saccharine Christian books and demand that they not sell them in the hospital because you can't do that to people. And I was thinking about how when Jesus was on the cross, in his moment of God forsakenness, when he enters into and gives voice to uh, utter sense of abandonment. He does that by quoting scripture. That somehow the experience of God forsakenness, of abandonment and disappointment in God in itself is given voice in God's word, in God's book. So that that act itself in some strange way also is an expression of trust and faithfulness in God. I was thinking in this world where there is so much concern and, and often such a temptation to give up hope and feeling like our world has lost its soul, our nation has lost its soul. I was thinking about the distinction, which I think we see in Jesus that is hard to put into words, but I would say it's the difference between the absence of hope and the presence of despair. In the Lord of the Rings, one of the great themes in it is hope and how do you carry on when it looks like what you want to have happen is not going to happen. And there's a character in it at one point uh, who wants to despair. He's the what's called the steward of Gondor. He's not the king. His, his sons will not be kings. They watch over Gondor until the true king comes back. And when the battle seems to be going bad, this particular character decides to put himself on a funeral pyre and light the match and end his life. And there's an element of self-pity in it. Um, and despair includes that. Uh, I think Despair is not simply saying that the outcome I wanted will not happen. It's saying that the actions that I take do not matter. So I don't have to carry on with my duty. I can give in to whatever impulse or the desire to quit that I want to. And one of the characters in that book, Gandalf, says, despair is only for those who can see clearly through to the end. And we cannot see clearly through to the end. Therefore, we cannot despair. Therefore, we cling to the hope of the scriptures, even though what it is that I most hope will happen in the lives of those that I love most dearly appears quite bleak to me. 
I enter into a sense of abandonment and God forsakenness that must be cried out. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But uh, I cannot see clearly through to the end. This is from Chris Lowney's book uh, where he talks about the legacy of Ignatius. And he says, people who are wise spiritually persevere not only out of pride, integrity, and commitment to their values, they persevere because they are all at once trusting, optimistic, foolish, and humble enough to hope and expect that the seeds of their efforts will blossom in times, ways, and places that they can neither predict nor control. So plant the seeds today and water them and nurture them in your words and your thoughts and your actions, in the people that you're with and the times in which you are alone to God crying out together with our friend Jesus. We embrace all of the pain and confusion and mystery and unknowing of life. We look at our world and we are not saccharine and we are not chirpy and we are not triumphalistic and we do not pretend to understand or believe more than we do, but we do not yet see clearly all the way to the end. Therefore, we do not despair. We cling to the hope of the man on the cross. That's our story. Allow God, trust that God will make this day count as you plant the seed. Hey, if you enjoyed that video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes from John Ortberg or Become New. You can also head to our website, becomenew.com, where we have a bunch more resources you might be interested in, like free downloads, books, and a library of videos for you to explore, learning how to grow spiritually one day at a time. If you've got a prayer request, you can text it to us at 855-888-0444 and you'll receive a written response from someone on our team who will pray for you. You can also text the word BECOME to that same number to receive text alerts whenever we drop a new video. Glad that you're here and we'll catch you next time.